In this video, I'm going to talk about multiple choice question slides. Okay, let's get started here. So, the types of multiple choice question slides I'm going to be talking about in this video are the ones that are specific to your final quiz in an Adobe Captivate project. Uh, we're not talking about knowledge checks. We're not talking about pretest questions. Uh, we're not talking about any of the other types of question slides. We're just going to focus on multiple choice question slides that contribute to a scorable quiz. So I have a couple of slides here that I've imported uh, or created on my standard uh, Canada quiz project here. And uh, you can do so just by selecting uh, question slides from the slides drop down icon here. Alternatively, you can use your quiz drop down menu and select question slide from the first option in that menu. But I already have them up here and these are default. This is what you're going to get out of the box with Adobe Captivate. In this case, I'm using version 9. Much of what we're going to talk about today is available in Captivate 8, Captivate 7, Captivate 6, Captivate 5.5, and version 5, I think. I don't think much changed over the last uh, four or five versions or so. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll identify some of the differences as we go. So, again, this is a, a default question type. You can know that it's a graded question type from this drop down uh, option box here. Uh, graded survey or pretest would be available. Also, you know it's not a knowledge check because a knowledge check has a graduation cap icon next to it in the film strip. So, what makes up a multiple choice uh, graded multiple choice question slide? Well, you've got a title, you've got a progress indicator here, you have a place to put in the question stem. And a question stem is just the term used to where the actual question goes. You have a, a placeholders for your answers. And you have some basic uh, controls and captions and review areas down at the bottom here. Um, let's start off by doing the types of things that I would typically do to customize uh, my multiple choice questions. So the first question that I'm going to put in here for my Canada quiz project is I'm looking to test the knowledge uh, of a single item. So this is there. There is only one correct answer here. Now, two possible answers, not really a lot. You've got a 50 50 chance of getting this question correct the way it's set up right now. So let's go to the quiz panel and just take a look at the number of answers. In this case, I'm going to change this to four answers. Could be three answers, it could be five answers, could be six answers, it doesn't really matter. Um, so what I'm going to put in here is I'm going to first of all put in my question stem. And this question is, which of the following cities is the capital of Canada. Now, let me quickly mention something about writing your questions out. They should be in the form of a question. I've seen people write, select the correct answer, uh, comma, um, most important fact of this course, period. That's not a question. The question begins with which, what, where, how, when, why, um, words like that. And it's followed by some specifics, but they are clear and they're concise. And the last little bit ends with a question mark. If you don't have a question mark at the end of your question, it's not really a question. So try to follow that. And it's, again, clear and concise. Um, you know, even though this is a, a project that's about you know, in this case, um, politics and geography of Canada. I want to say of Canada. If I say which of the following cities is the capital, I'm not very specific. Your, your questions, just like your learning objectives, would be very, very specific and clear and concise. Your questions need to be as well. 
There is only one answer to this question. So when I take a look at the quiz panel, uh, I don't have multiple answers checked off because there aren't multiple correct answers. I don't bother randomizing myself uh, by selecting a different position for the correct answer to be. I always make it the first answer. And if I truly want to randomize it, I select shuffle. So the correct answer in this case is the city of Ottawa. And I'm going to put in three distractors. Uh, distractors are the wrong answers. Uh, they're called distractors because their purpose is to distract you away from the correct answer. Uh, in this case here, it's very important, not just with this question, but with all of your multiple choice questions, to have distractors that are at least plausible. Right? You don't want to just make up fake city names as possible answers here because the user will see through that and um, the question won't be challenging for them. You do want the question to be challenging. Also, don't try to be funny either. I find that sometimes uh, learning uh, instructional designers will try to be funny with their answers by, you know, saying uh, Sydney, Australia. Well, obviously, Sydney, Australia is not the capital of Canada. So I'm actually going to choose uh, three different Canadian cities and even go so far as to make sure that these are actual plausible Canadian cities for what could potentially be a capital of Canada. Uh, I'm not going to put in, for example, Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw, I would choose Moose Jaw because the word itself is funny. But seriously, it's a small city. It's located way out of the way of things. It's very unlikely to be the capital of Canada. So I'm going to choose a very old city, Montreal. It's been around for a very long time. It's very plausible that it could have very well have become a capital of Canada at one point. Canada's largest city, Toronto. And uh, I'm going to choose on the east, sorry, the west coast side, I'm going to choose Vancouver, another big city in Canada. Again, these are all plausible cities where the capital of Canada could be. This way, if a user hasn't paid attention during the course, they could easily be distracted by Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. It's possible. Uh, whereas if I simply put in a bunch of ridiculous answers, Ottawa becomes all that more plausible and easier to guess as the correct answer. So this is actually set up as a good question here. Now, I know you can't really see a lot of what's going on here because some of the stuff is stacked, but there's an incomplete caption here. You must answer the question before continuing. There's an incorrect caption here as well, and there's a correct caption. So there's three possible outcomes. Either the user forgets to select an answer and tries to hit submit, in which case they're going to get this first caption. Uh, or if they choose wrong, they're going to get incorrect. If they choose right, they're going to get correct. The only thing that's really remaining is at this point is what happens um, at the end of the question. The default for Adobe Captivate multiple choice questions is to simply continue. But I prefer to go to next slide. There's no delay when you choose that. So I choose that for the success action but I also choose it as the last attempt action. In other words, the action that occurs when I get this incorrect. So I'll, I'll have one try to get this particular question right. I'll be presented with some feedback and then I can proceed to the next question. Now in this case, here we have another default multiple choice question input into our project, but I'm going to make some changes to this. First off, like the other one, I'm going to make a the number of answers to be four. But in this case, instead of having a single correct answer, I'm actually going to choose multiple answers and choose a second correct answer here as well. Oh, incidentally, I should go back to this and make sure shuffle answers is on so that these show up random. And I'm going to do the same for this one as well. So this question's a little bit different. And we're going to ask the question, um, what are Canada's two official 
languages. Again, like before, this question begins with what, where, how, why, when, which, and so on, and ends in a question mark. So it's very clearly a question. There is only, well, in this case, two answers that are correct, or two answers that when combined together are correct. And this leads me to another point here. Because I have multiple answers, I do have the opportunity to assign partial scores to this question. So these two answers combined are worth 10 points. In other words, they're, they potentially, if I select partial score, are worth five points each. So how do you determine how you should set up all the different types of multiple choice questions? This, in this case, I believe is dictated by the content. I always ask myself, what is the expected performance in real life? So let's complete this and we'll talk about this a little bit further. What are Canada's two official languages? Well, in no particular order, they are French and English. We'll get to the distractors in a moment. Let's consider what these answers are worth by themselves. So if I have partial score corrected, uh, selected like I do here, French by itself could be worth five points and English by itself could be worth five points. If you select both of them, you'll get full points, 10 points in this case. But do I want to award partial points for answering this question technically only half right? Well, again, what is the expectation in real life? You have to consider who is this quiz for? If this quiz is for a bunch of high school students who've simply completed their geography course, uh, then perhaps half points, or in this case, uh, five points for each correct answer is fair. Um, but if your job was to be a tour guide at the parliament buildings in Ottawa, and you're giving dignitaries from other countries tours of our nation's capital, this is an important fact that they need to know, and they need to know it 100% of the time, not half of the information half of the time. So for them, the expected performance is going to be a lot higher than it would be for, say, a high school student. Another example, you might think, oh, well, Paul, you're being too harsh on these people. Yes, they should get half points for choosing French, but forgetting about English for a moment. Well, again, think of it in this, this context. Here's another example that's that I think can show you uh, what the expectation or the expected performance in real life would be. Let's say there was a question for airline pilots and the airline pilots were asked, what are the four steps to successfully and safely land an aircraft. Personally, I want my airline pilot to know all four of those steps. I don't want them to know three. I don't want to give them points for knowing two, or God forbid, I certainly don't want to award them points for just getting one of them correct. I think that's an all or nothing situation, in which case I would choose no partial score. You have to get both answers correct to get those 10 points. Incidentally, if you do choose a partial score, you have the ability to add a partially correct caption as well. But uh, that's for you to decide whether you wish to include that information or not. It's completely optional. So I need two distractors. Again, like before, these need to be plausible distractors. So you don't want to choose something like Swahili because since Swahili is an African language and most people know that, uh, you're only putting it in there because it's got some funny letters in it and it's a funny sounding word. Uh, you're not putting it in there because you're serious about it being a distractor to French and English. You might want to choose a made up language as long as it sounds plausible, like the made up language of Canadian. Some people somewhere in the world might think that in Canada we speak Canadian, 
that's actually not true, of course, as we all know. But, you know, again, that's not a bad distractor. Another distractor that might be good in this situation would be a language that maybe is spoken uh, close to Canada. Uh, so we can choose Icelandic, maybe. I'm not sure if that's actually a language or just uh, a reference to things from Iceland. But this is not a bad question either. So we have some distractors in there that are plausible. People might choose them. Hopefully they choose English and French because they've, they've actually learned the real content. Let's quickly go through just a few other the options that are on the screen. Uh, again, you have correct and incomplete captions. You have the opportunity to assign a time limit to multiple choice questions. I encourage you to only do this not to make a course challenging or more difficult for your users, uh, but rather because in real life, the expected performance has a time limit associated with it. So for example, if a, a welder needs to complete a task within 30 seconds of heating up a piece of metal, perhaps that time limit could be set for 30 seconds. And then you would have, of course, a timeout caption to go with that as well. The other thing is that you can add additional navigation controls. Um, you can add a clear button to reset the question uh, if it hasn't already been answered incorrectly. And you can also add additional back and skip buttons that are available to you as well. In addition to those back and skip buttons, you'll see that there is also special review mode next buttons and back buttons. And this is unique for Adobe Captivate 9. This was introduced in 9 and this allows users who are reviewing their quiz to not have uh, next and back buttons during the actual quiz question under normal circumstances. These only appear when you're reviewing the quiz. The final little bit here deals with the actions for this particular question. So again, on success, what do you want to have happen? I like to go to next slide. That's usually the option I choose. You can choose more than one attempt. So if you want users to try this question two times or three times, you can set that up. And if you choose two attempts, you can add an additional retry caption. And then you can have additional failure messages as well. So if you don't like the retry message, you could have two individual failure messages. One could be an initial failure message that says, sorry, you're incorrect. Please try again or try to recall what you learned in the previous lesson. And then the final failure message, which will be you, you run out of tries, click uh, anywhere to continue, that sort of thing. And again, the last attempt, what happens at that point? Again, I like to set that as go to next slide. Of course, make sure your reporting is checked off because of course you want to be able to report on this in your learning management system. And your users, of course, want to be able to show success uh, once they've successfully completed the course. Guys, if you like the videos that I'm producing for you, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel. And if you thought this video was helpful or useful, go ahead and give me a thumbs up.